Hi, I'm Travis Cochran, and this video is for all of the traditional LD debaters who are getting ready for the January-February 2024 military presence topic. So if you're excited about value criteria, stick around. This topic analysis is for you. What is the specific wording of that topic? It is resolved. The United States ought to substantially reduce its military presence in the West Asia, North Africa region. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about a lot. You know, first, we're going to talk about some strategic approaches that are very important for traditional LD debaters. Second, we're going to talk about frameworks that traditional LD debaters can use for their case construction. You know, those all important value criteria. Then we're going to talk about some ideas for those Phil debaters out there for the AF and the NEG. We'll talk about Kant, but we're going to talk about some other sorts of philosophies that you can consider. And then we'll wrap it up with some contention discussion on the AF, the NEG, and some contention areas that are going to be useful for both the AF and the NEG. But before we get into talking about everything that you need to know as a traditional LD debater for the military presence topic, Let's first give you a warning. This is not a topic analysis, okay? You are not going to get a discussion of definitions. You're not going to get a discussion of what is topical, what is not topical, what kind of cases you can specifically expect. All of that stuff is done in other lectures by Scott. You know, Scott Brown has two other lectures that you should watch before you should even view this lecture. All right, there's a military topic lecture that's all about the definitions and the history and the background. And this is going to tell you all about what nations are in the North Africa, Middle East region. It's also going to tell you about all of the different sorts of types of military presence that the United States has in this region. And it's going to tell you a lot more about what you can expect is AF ground and NEG ground. We're not going to get into that specifically in this. So you should watch those two other lectures before you get here. So you're going to get the military presence one, but you also need to watch the topicality lecture. Now, in addition to that, there's going to be another lecture that's coming soon, and that is for all of the progressive LD debaters. And that will cover, you know, the different sorts of policy, AFs and NEGs, disadvantages, counter plans, as well as critical affirmatives and negatives. But that's not going to come out for another few days. So, first thing that we need to talk about is what kinds of strategic considerations should traditional LD debaters be thinking about for the military presence topic? So before you begin researching, before you begin writing your cases, there's a few sort of truths that you need to grapple with when picking out what kind of things you're interested in. You know, the first one is that you need to think through strategies for dealing with a polarized judge pool. Now, Traditional LD debaters often have parent judges, lay judges in the back of the room. The occasional progressive judge or flow judge definitely waddles in the back, but oftentimes it's parent judges. Now, parent judges are supposed to put their biases and their personal beliefs behind once they enter that room and when they're rendering their decisions. But we can have a circle of truth conversation here for a little bit. That is an actual impossibility, and that never happens. Those biases creep into every round. They creep into every decision, and to pretend that they don't is going to do a disservice to you as a debater. Don't deny reality. Accept it and work with it. Now, that's very important for this particular topic. We're talking about military presence in the uh, North Africa, West Asia region, and we're going to be covering hotspots and conflicts that a lot of people feel very, very passionately about, that impact their lives, that impact the lives of their loved ones. We're talking about Israel and Gaza. It is on the top of a lot of people's minds right now, and a lot of people have very, very, very strong feelings about it on all sides of the issue for very, very good reason. And so depending on what you are saying in this topic, you could be speaking about issues that people already have their minds made up about. Now, you can hope that they're going to suspend all of those beliefs. You can hope 
that they're going to pretend that those biases don't exist and they're going to render an objective and rational decision. Personally, I don't think that ever happens. Okay. And so I think that on this topic, depending on what you talk about, you run into the issue of just getting a win or a loss because you have a case that aligns with some pre-existing ideas of the judge in the back. Now, how do you avoid that? Well, maybe you don't want to. Maybe you come from a particular area, a particular region, a particular circuit where you have a pretty homogenous group of judges, in which case maybe you know what it is that they feel and maybe you can work your cases to lean into that. Now, if so, well, that's just using a simple fact of reality and using it to your advantage. Now, if your area isn't as homogenous, well, then that's a very risky proposition because you might be leaning into some sort of belief that you think exists and you just might be making a wrong assumption. Or just through the magic of tab room, you might get a lot of aberrations and a lot of exceptions to the rule and a lot of people who do not believe what the majority of people in your area believe. In which case, well, that might not work out so well for you. So one other strategy that you can employ to deal with this sort of issue is that you can talk about issues that are not specific to these hot button issues where people already have dug in beliefs. Instead, you can speak to some meta issues on the resolution that allow you to prove either the af or the neg without focusing on the specificity of topics that make it too hard to separate biases from objective judging. Now, the second thing that you need to consider is that this is a very, very, very broad topic. If you don't know what I mean by that, that's why you got to go watch Scott's other videos. You got to watch the uh, topic analysis video that goes in the history, the background, and the definitions. And then you got to also watch the topicality video. If you go through those, you're going to get a better idea of what we mean when we say this is broad. There's a lot of affirmative ground. There's a lot of nations. There's a lot of different types of military presence from types of troops to types of basing to types of operations to types of weapon systems. All of these are fair ground. And so how are you going to deal with that? Well, you can lean into that yourself and have very niche areas to talk about on either the AF or the NEG. Or again, you can try and come up with some broader strategies that hopefully answer large swaths of both AFs and NEGs. So that way you're not scrambling to answer all the niche strategies round to round. And then finally, one thing that you might want to consider is, is your AF ready to beat progressive LDRs. Now, I know that if you're a traditional LDR, that might not be your thing. You know, you might have eschewed that. You said, I don't want to mess around with those other types. You know, I like my circuit. I am qualifying for my state championships. I am qualifying for my national championships. And you know what? That's awesome. You should do that. But sometimes those progressive LDRs, they show up in those local tournaments. They show up in those state quals. They show up in those state championships. And sometimes you get progressive judges that show up in the back too. Now, you just don't want to take those rounds and say, ah, shucks, I guess that's a loss. No, you want to have cases that went in front of lay judges, went in front of parent judges, went in front of traditional judges, but also they can win in front of progressive judges. You can do that. But one of the best ways to do that is to write cases that don't lean into the strengths of progressive teams. Now, I'll talk about what that means a little bit later, but I'll give you a preview. That means avoiding util and consequentialism if possible. All right. So those are the strategic approaches or at least the big strategic considerations that all traditional LDRs should have for the military presence topic. Next, we're going to talk about some of the frameworks that you can use on both the AF and the NEG. Okay, the value criteria case structure it's the bedrock, the foundation of traditional Lincoln-Douglas debate. Now, the good news for everybody is that a lot of the value criteria that we can talk about today are going to apply to both sides of the resolution. You can use them on the AF or the NEG, honestly. So just some analysis and just some contentions get flipped around. And the reason for this is pretty simple. It's the wording of the resolution. The resolution says the United States ought to substantially reduce 
its military presence, okay? So AFs and NEGs do not have to entirely eliminate military presence, nor do they have to defend all military presence. So AFs can say some military presence is bad, but some we can keep. And NEGs have that same sort of flexibility. So a lot of the value criteria can be used on either side. So we're not really going to focus on how one works for the AF or the NEG, except for when we talk about some of the more specific fill cases here in a little bit. So let's talk about values first. What are going to be some of the common values that you can use for the military presence topic? Well, morality, of course, you can do that. You can do that on every topic. Um, a lot of the justice ones also work well on every strand of justice, from social justice to environmental justice to the Rawlsian justice. All the justices. We care about justice. It's important. And you can make a strong argument on both the AF and the NEG side of the resolution that when you're talking about what nation states should do and nation states pretty much have obligations obligations to their citizens as well as other nation states, upholding justice is going to be the highest value that it is. Now, aside from that, you also have right to life. Now, the flip side of that, or, you know, I don't know if it's the flip side of that, but it's the same, you know, opposite side of the same coin or something, whatever. Similar thing to it is, aside from right to life, is that life is a prerequisite. So if we don't have life, we can't exercise any other rights. We can't exercise any other values. So we should preserve life. Now, aside from just life itself as a biological sort of thing, there is also the quality of life. You know, not only should we get to like live and breathe, we should have good lives and we should have value to life. There should be meaning and we shouldn't have some sort of uh deplorable existence just because we are alive you know we should have something to look forward to we should have joy we should have relationality we should have all the good things we should have love um another good value that you're going to see a lot is safety and or security because again we're talking about the obligations for the federal government. We're talking about what the federal government should do with its military. And so there's a lot of philosophers and ethicists and moralists who tell us that the prime thing that a nation state should do, especially as it concerns uh, what it should be doing with its military, is preserving the safety and the security of its sovereign citizens. And so that is a good reason in and of itself why that might be the... Uh, paramount value that we're trying to achieve. Um, aside from that, there's also dignity. Um, nation states also, as through a social contract, also, uh, you know, Kant cares about dignity. Lots of people care about dignity, it turns out, you know, and that goes back to a value to life sort of thing. So dignity can be a criteria, but also be a value that basically there is no point in living if we do not have dignity or autonomy or liberty, those types of things. Who cares about rights if we can't exercise choices? Who cares about, you know, joy if we can't have the freedom to experience the types of joy that we have? So are there more values? Oh, absolutely. But there's a lot of these. Now, again, as we were talking about crafting strategic traditional cases that you can also use to answer progressive teams, you can pick morality. But remember... A lot of those progressive teams, they want that debate too. They want to get into util debates. They want to get into consequentialism debates because those big policy teams can then just read all their disads at you. They can read all their counterplans at you. They can do all of that at you. I would stay away from that, okay? I would stick more to some of the other types because then that gives you a lot more strategic flexibility in beating those progressive teams. Because I don't care whether you're a traditional LD debater, I don't care if you're a tricks debater, I don't care if you're a fill debater, a critical debater, a performance debater, or a, a you know, quote-unquote LARP. You're, you should try and win. Winning's fun. You know, debate's good even when you lose. I think it's inherently valuable. But debate's a lot more fun when you win. All right, so let's talk about what kind of criteria you can use on this topic to win some debates. Now, there's a lot more criteria that you can use that are going to help with all of these values. Now, some of these criteria you can use for a lot of those different values, you know, it can be a mad libs of value criteria. You can do the consequentialism and utilitarianism. Again, while it's easy to write a case, it's not strategic when you debate policy teams or progressive teams because they can read all of their policy and progressive arguments out you. 
why give them that? Now you can do deontology or Kantian ethics. We'll talk about that a lot more in the fill section. But for the same reasons, I would stay away from it from a strategic perspective. You can do it if you're comfortable with it, but everybody's prepared for that. Now, in addition to something that a lot more people are familiar with is the structural violence affirmatives. Those are great on both the AF and the NEG, and those I do recommend those do have wonderful strategic value, both versus the policy teams, if you want to beat the progressive teams and or the philosophy teams and or the uh, critical teams. So those are useful strategic case structures when you're trying to think about all the different types of debates that you need to win as a traditional debater. Now, some other ones that we've talked about for previous topics, international law, we talked about with the right to housing, international law is important. You can use that uh, in a lot of strategic ways. You can use that even if you win that, you know, the other team wins that util or consequentialism or one of these other things are important metrics. You can win that things like international law are important or paramount because violation of international law would be really bad according to utilitarian ethics. Plus, you can just get into these weird definitional debates that just make things good. Now, at the same time, constitutionality is something that I'm going to bring up in this instance because there is a lot of concern as to how a lot of the military presences that we have in the North Africa, West Asia region, you know, came about. Some of these are secret programs that have been done by intelligence operations or, you know, parts of the military that weren't authorized by traditional or constitutional processes. So there could be some good arguments on the AF as to how maybe what is best to uphold justice or the social contract or what the United States federal government ought to do is the United States federal government ought to uphold the Constitution. And I don't care whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. It can lead to horrible consequences. The number one obligation the United States federal government has is to uphold the Constitution. And the best thing to do would to be to withdraw our military presence. Same thing can be said true for democracy. You know, uh, how many of these wars did Congress vote on? Maybe that should be a question. Social contract. You know, are these wars keeping our citizens safe? Does our nation, our federal government, have an obligation to send our citizens off to wars that might not be just in the first place that risk their own life? Is, is that a fair part of the social contract? Are they... Is, is that what we've given up rights for? We'll talk about that with Hobbes and some other people in a little bit late. You know, human rights, we talked about that with a lot of other topics, but that's also relevant here because war is ugly. War is... I mean, that's an understatement, okay? I, I haven't been in the midst of it. I can't speak to it, but, you know, atrocities are committed in every situation. Human rights are violated. That is just the nature of war. And the flip side of that is true. Sometimes wars are initiated in order to stop human rights violations. Now, does that make them good? Again, this is what's for debate. So human rights can be a criteria on either side of the resolution. Now, an interesting one here that you can use is just war theory. Again, philosophers and ethicists have been theorizing and philosophizing for thousands of years about the nature of war and what makes a war just. Again, we're concerned with justice here. Um, what makes one right? What makes a war moral? And that is not only how we engage in war, what kind of methods, but how do we respond to it? What do we do after? All aspects of war have been considered. And so the types of military presences that we have they may or may not be legitimate or illegitimate based on various readings of just war theory. So that's a good one that you can use on the AF or the NEG that, again, might be a little weird for those consequentialism, utilitarianism, LARP teams to answer because they don't have to answer a lot of that stuff. And that's sort of the key to being strategic against those types of debaters. Get them off of their blocks. Have them talking about something that they're not comfortable talking about that you are. That's always a good strategy when dealing with progressive debaters. Now, something that a lot of these progressive debaters are going to be familiar with, but is still out there for you, and you can still speak on with a lot more nuance than a lot of debaters currently do, are different theories of international relations, which could be criteria for how we determine what 
the federal government should do. You know, one concept is realism, and we're going to talk a lot more about that with the fill section. And there's different versions of, of realism, whether offensive realism, defensive realism, lots of different realisms. Um, also, same thing with hegemony, which is basically just the leadership of an individual nation. And there's a lot of different types of leadership structures for a world. You can be talking about unipolar worlds where it's maybe we should have a single hegemon, a global leader, and maybe that's best for a lot of things. Or maybe we should have a bipolar situation or maybe a bipolar situation is bad where you have two global leaders that are balancing each other. You can have regionalism where there's different competing regional blocks that are holding stability or multipolarity where you got a bunch of different leaders maybe and that looks like something like league of nations un type stuff or it looks like other things now there's another interesting sort of criteria that we're going to talk about here that's the ethics of the executioner now there's a theorist Rene Berez who talks about how civilizations have an ethical obligation to protect themselves. And so when people designate themselves as somehow enshrined with the task of wiping out or eradicating someone else, you have to just treat them as existential threats. And the only ethical thing to do is think as through an executioner. And this is, a criteria that you can use if you want to talk about certain types of maybe the only types of military presence are for those where in instances of really heinous acts of violence or there's just people that have been deemed radical evil. Now, this is, you know, certain terrorist groups, certain genocidal regimes. And I get that this is a very loaded term. And we're talking about this in traditional LD circles. And I promise you that we will cover this in critical questions. And now these types of discussions, woo, who's good, who's bad, who's evil, who determines those things? Whoa, very powerful, okay? Um, and then once you determine someone's evil, ooh, what does that justify? What kind of actions does that justify? So these are loaded conversations, but these are definite case structures that you can do or you can consider or maybe the ethical thing to do is actually to have a military presence to stamp out groups. Because remember, one of the reasons why we have the military presence in this region is in response to the 9-11 attacks. There are some theorists that say that that is a truly objective good no matter what. Am I saying that? I'm saying nothing. I'm saying that's up for debate, and I'm saying you can make a case for it. That's all I'm here to do. I'm the messenger, all right? That's it. Now, on the other side of this, if you don't want to say that, uh, you know, if you want you want some more uh, friendly, uh, huggy, soft gloves uh, versions of AFs, there's also liberal internationalism. These are some great uh, AF structures where instead of foreign policy being dictated by hard military stuff, we should maybe talk with other nations. We should work through the UN. We should work through other structures. And this also lends itself to other types of things like cosmopolitanism, which is based on the works of Derrida. And again, it is a specific type of liberal internationalism that's predicated on the notion of hospitality, where we are all global citizens working towards uh, global issues and that things are not isolated one nation or another, things like nuclear weapons, things like environmental pollution, things like climate change, things like injustice, things like structural violence. These are global conditions, and as global citizens, we should work towards global solutions. And then finally, you can use decolonization as a criteria and as an interesting sort of case discussion. I mean, if you want to talk about the root cause of everything that's happening here in the North Africa, West Asia region, there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of colonization and where borders were drawn between competing colonizing nations without respect to culture, ethnicity, religion, race, any other kind of structural organization. And so different groups of people were separated, tossed in with other people, other ways of life, and then all of their resources and power were taken away. And this has led to a situation where colonization still has effects that are going on today. And there's 
a lot of theorists who argue that military presence in the region is just a continuation of that old school colonization from the middle of the 19th or the middle of the, you know, the 50, age of exploration. And in doing so, whether it's messy, whether it's ugly, whether it's consequences or not, reducing the United States military presence as an act of decolonization is an inherent good. Now, for those of y'all that are like, can that really work with traditional LD? Absolutely. Now, here's why. Again, we talked about those biases that parents have and that a lot of people have. A lot of people look at that region and be like, those people have been fighting for hundreds of years. It's just a thing. You can explain and tap into that sort of sentiment with the story about, you're right, they have been fighting for hundreds of years because it's been colonization that triggered it in the first place. So no coloni So because colonization was the problem, colonization will never be the solution. Now, if you think I'm just talking all willy-nilly here, then that's fine. You can put that in your pocket and save that for the progressive lecture. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about the fill afs and negs, all right? Um, I know for most of y'all that just means Kant. I get that. But there are other philosophies out there, I promise you. And there's a lot of them that are super relevant to this topic, okay? Now... I get that you all think about Kant, but Hobbes is important too. Um, and all of the sort of people who draw on sort of Hobbesian concepts. Um, Kant and Hobbes were at odds, all right? There's this battle of the old dudes happening in terms of uh, 17th century theorists or 16th century theorists or 1600s. I don't really know how that works. Anyway. They disagreed over the fundamental nature of humans, and those disagreements really shaped different philosophical approaches to ethical systems for governments as well as individuals. And that really means, like, what should governments do and what individuals do? And those two questions are super relevant to our resolution. Now, the big beef that they have with each other is over two questions. You know, one, what's the nature of dignity as it means to be a human? And what's the nature of self-interest as it relates to being a human? So when it comes to dignity, Kant believes that all rational humans deserve dignity. There you go. Pretty simple. Now, Hobbes, for Hobbes, that's just hogwash. Life ain't dignified. Okay. Uh, there's a famous sort of quote that I might butcher that's attributed to Hobbes, which he says sort of describes our, you know, humanity and what he calls state of nature. Hobbes believes that humans and the world is just kind of a state of horrible anarchic chaos where it's kill or be killed. You know, you live an ugly death. Meteors kill asteroids. Life happens. You react to it. You got to survive. You want dignity? Sorry. Self-interest, Kant says that egotism, that's irrational, okay? Because we can all work better if we're cooperative. And so self-interest is something that we should rationally work to excise from our being and what we do. Hobbes says, no, that's hogwash. Self-interest is human nature. We're all selfish little creatures, and we're all going to be selfish little creatures, and we should use that as the basis for deciding how we interact with each other, and to pretend that we're all not selfish little creatures is a pure fantasy that will have devastating consequences if we believe. So how is this relevant? Well, a lot of Hobbesian theorists tell us what we need to do as nation-states, okay? They tell us that, well, hey, out there, it's chaos. The world is trying to kill you. A lot of people are trying to kill you. Bears are trying to kill you. Sharks are trying to kill you. The weather's trying to kill you. The space is trying to kill you. The air is trying to kill you. Everything's trying to kill you, and you got to survive. That is the paramount thing that you need to do. And so, because of that, we bound together as humans for collective survival. Because, you know what? Me versus a bear, I'm going to lose. But, uh, you know, 20 of us versus a bear... I got a better shot. So there's this collective survival that comes in with creating a society and engaging in social contracts. And then we form these nation states and these societies that protect us from bears and things like that. And Sharknados, maybe. I don't know. Um, so we have these nation states. So what should nation states do? Well, they should act in their own self-interest. We're all selfish little creatures. 
nation states are made up of humans who are all selfish little creatures. All of us selfish little creatures as a collective, we're all going to do what's best for our own selfish little collective that we call the nation state. All right. So what does that mean? Well, Reducing military presence? Sure. If it's in our best interest as the United States federal government, should we maintain increased military presence? Sure. If it's in our best interest, I mean, should we do some of that, all of that, none of that? Sure. If it's in our best interest, because whatever's in the best interest of the United States federal government is what we should do. That would always be best according to these sort of Hobbesian philosophies. We'll get into some specific ones later. Now, since we should always assume that whatever's best for the nation state is always the best, we should also expect that that's how all other nation states are going to act. So if we're trying to guess what other nations are going to do, are they going to be nice with us? Are they going to cooperate with us? Are they going to attack us? Are they going to stonewall with us? Are they going to um, ally with our enemies? Are they going to trade with us? Well, if you want to know the answer to that question, just ask one basic question in return what's in their best interest because there's always going to do the same thing and that is the fundamental nature of reality according to Hobbesians so who are the current sort of Hobbesians that you can use and what kind of things you can do well a lot of the consequentialists you know I mean Hobbesian ethics are and understandings of IR are inherently consequentialist because it says that if you're supposed to do things that are in your best self-interest, how do you know it's in your best self-interest if you don't evaluate it according to the consequences? So if you like consequentialist debates, these different sorts of like IR Hobbesian peoples, well, they're up your alley. And those are the types of realists. Who are realists? Well, they believe that nation states act in their own self-interest. So is military presence good? I don't know. Is it good for the United States? If us having troops all over the world is best for us, you better believe that we should do that. Now, if the flip side is true, then we shouldn't do that. Now, deterrence is also something that we should do. You know, we should assume that other nations might want to attack us. It might be good for them. So the best thing that we can do on our own interest is deter them from attacking us. We should scare them away from attacking us. And maybe our troops are key to do that. Now, also self-defense. We all have the right to self-defense. Remember, survival is paramount and there are bad people in the world. If other nations might view it in their own self-interest to attack us, so it is our obligation, it is our right, it is our duty as citizens of nation states to expect that our nation, the United States federal government, will engage in self-defense. What does that look like? Mm, maybe military presence. Now, also extinction framing. So the nation state is supposed to, you know, protect us. We've engaged in this social contract where we've given up certain rights and freedoms. I'm not allowed to go around doing certain things, you know, as much as I would like to just yell at people and someone's like playing their music really loud. I'd like to go and just, you know, somehow stop that from happening because I'm an old man, whatever. I can't go around and doing what I want and, you know, infringing on others' rights. Okay, I've given up that right in exchange to live in a society where I get protected for bears and other nations. All right. So extinction framing is important and plays in with these kinds of theories and understandings because, well, uh, the government should probably stop us from extinction. And, you know, anything could possibly come into these sorts of philosophical questions and understandings in some sort of way, because if it's best for the nation state, you can argue that it's consistent. Okay, let's give you what you want. For all of you field debaters out there, I know you want to talk about Kant, so we're going to talk about Kant, okay? So we're going to talk about which rights and or obligations can be deemed universal and would be deemed justifications for reduced military presence. So let's talk about Kant on the AF. First one, human rights. Some pretty good arguments that human rights, universal to all humans, hence they are human rights, are being violated in egregious ways by United States military presence, thus re significantly reducing our presence, at least in the places and in the ways in which it violates human rights, is something we ought to do. Same thing applies with dignity. Our military presence can provide a lot of indignity to a lot of individuals, especially in the host nations where our bases are. And so in those scenarios, yeah, we should also remove our military presence. The notion of sovereignty is also an important concept when it comes to Kantian understandings of military presence and war. Uh, the idea that the nation state is an inviolable sort of structure. We should always respect 
other people's nation states. We should respect our borders. We should respect our laws. We should respect their borders, their laws. So we should not invade their sovereignty. Well, you know, us having military presence and launching military operations on other people's borders against their citizens is directly in violation of sovereignty, which some might say is something that should be universally respected. Same thing is true with democratic processes. Now, this applies both at home. I already discussed that there's a very good discussion surrounding, you know, whether or not the wars that we pursue and the military presences that we have are authorized through democratic processes. But there's also a really good discussion of whether or not our military presence is actually thwarting democracies abroad. The thing is about democracy is that sometimes we don't like the results of our vote. It's true in our nation where half the nation doesn't like what happens every election, but that's also true of us and our feelings towards other nations. There are other nations where we are engaging in military conflict against governments that have been democratically elected. So maybe reducing military presence and or keeping military presence could impact democratic processes. And finally, again, rule of law. You know, if these wars are illegal, then we have an obligation to follow the rule of law. And that is paramount. Rule of law always matters. If not, then there's no basis for law. And then we have what Hobbes fears more than anything. Anarchy. All right. So Kant on the neg. So which rights and or obligations can be deemed universal and be justified for maintaining or increasing military presence or the opposite? Treaty obligations. You know, there are nations that we have promised to protect, that we have signed defense obligations with, such as Israel, such as NATO. And our military presence could be necessary to uphold those obligations. And when you make a promise, you should universally protect it. Right to protect is also something that can be considered. Uh, right to protect is an international law theory that says that certain that we have an obligation to protect certain groups in horrific instances. So when genocide is occurring, we have a right to protect or actually responsibility to protect rather where we must intervene in those instances. So it's not that we have a right, we have an obligation um, to intervene. Same thing is true with humanitarian interventions. So in their instances where uh, people need humanitarian aid, our military presence might be necessary to do that, especially if there's combat areas and combat zones that might impact humanitarian aid getting to the people who need it the most. In those instances, military presence, there's a lot of theorists who say there is a universal obligation to intervene in those instances. Same thing with the right to self-defense. We always universally have a right to defend ourselves. Same thing can be argued and has been argued, whether you believe it true or not, that we have a right to prevent or preempt attacks that we know inevitable are inevitable. Now, this is a complicated sort of discussion, especially since the right to preemptive warfare is exactly what's part of the Bush doctrine and is a part of the whole philosophy, the neoconservative philosophy that led to the attacks, the, you know, the war on Iraq as well as our war in Afghanistan in response to the 9-11 attacks. And then again, just war theory. I talked about that, how, you know, maybe some of these military presence things, we shouldn't get rid of them because they are just. And justice is the paramount consideration when we're talking about what our government should do in the universal arena or in the international arena. All right. Now that we talked about all the different value criteria for the Phil cases, the trad cases, the, all the other cases, let's talk about the contention areas, okay? Because that's what y'all are excited about. And there's a lot of them, especially for the AF. So we're going to talk about the contentions in three parts. We're going to talk about all the contentions that are mostly for the AF side of the resolution. We're going to talk about all the contentions that are mostly for the NEG side of the resolution. And then we're going to talk about the contentions that are for everybody. It's a veritable grab bag, whoever wants to talk about these contentions. So the AF part, there's a lot of them, okay? There's going to be three slides full of them. So the first one are various domestic contentions. And... 
again, we've talked about some of these. So whether or not democratic process as to how we choose which wars to engage in, whether it's civil military relations, which is basically how much power the military has in our country, um, but also things like polarization and populism, how divided our nation is, you know, how active are populist elements, populist movements, populist politics, and well, populist violence, but also social spending. If we're using all this money for bombs and bases and jet fuel, we're not using it for social security or health care or roads. Also structural racism. And the way that the military recruiting works, if you're not so familiar, it disproportionately impacts marginalized groups. Those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged are those that are predominantly targeted by the military, which means that those that are uh, sent to war, those that are put into combat zones, those that face a lot of the different problems that the military uh, service members experience while being a part of the military presence. And so all of that is part and parcel of these military operations. And then as well as militarism, which is just this general notion that the military and this idea that we need the military and this notion that we need military violence and that it's always good and that military is always the solution has just pervaded into every aspect of our lives. Can't go to a football game, can't go to a baseball game, can't do anything without saluting the troops or watching a flyby of some sort of jet. The military has creeped into every single sort of aspect of our social lives, and part of that is because we do so much to support these foreign interventions. Now, there's more, but there's a lot to cover. Now, there's also a lot of international law contentions. Uh, again, there's been a lot of international law cases that said that some of the different military presences and a lot of the different operations that we have are not, quote-unquote, legal. Now, us then getting rid of these military presences could put us more in accordance with international law. So doing that would boost international law credibility, which would help us strengthen other forms of you know, international law, whether we're talking about human rights, whether we're talking about Paris Accords, whatever. Same thing is true with UN, UN credibility. The United Nations has issued several resolutions in the past that has condemned the actions of our military presence in the region. We could give them a credibility boost by giving them a little hat tip and saying, you're right, we'll do what you think. Same thing is true for the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Remember that whole Bush Doctrine thing? Well, some of the things that we've did, there's been people who said that, well, we've committed war crimes. We've tortured individuals uh, with our detention centers in Abu Ghraib and, and um, with our detention in Guantanamo Bay. All of these are perpetuating this military presence abroad. Maybe by us acknowledging some of these war crimes and then pulling back our military presence, we could then strengthen the international legitimacy of the International Criminal Court, which could do other good things like maybe go after Putin or some of this other stuff. War scenario contentions. All right, look, I'm not going to talk about specific countries and specific scenarios because all of this stuff is in general. Go look at Scott's lectures because for every single country that they're talking about, there's a bunch of different specific scenarios. We're just going to give you sort of the general tendencies that you can look for and apply to whatever country or presence you want to talk about. So there's a lot of different ways that wars can happen with our troops in the North Africa, West Asia reason. One is draw in, which is basically that by us being in there, other different different kind of belligerent groups are going to be intentionally attacking us to try and draw us into greater conflicts. We see this happening right now. Um, what's happening with the, uh, um, with the, our presence in the region for the, in support of Israel and their Gaza operations. We have different ships and destroyers that are out there in the Red Sea that are getting a barrage of rocket attacks at that. Now, their goal is to try and then get us to then attack back and have counterattacks. They want to draw us in to a larger conflict, which could then draw in other players. It would make us look really bad. It would make us look like the aggressors. And that is their goal. Now, Another scenario in which a large war can start in this region is through miscalculation. Right now we have a presence. Now let's say, for instance, that same scenario happens, okay, where these rebels are shooting rockets at our ships. What happens if they shoot them from a base in 
a belligerent nation at us? What if they're able to disguise them as maybe specifically from a nation that we already consider as hostile, like Iran. Now, we could assume that the attack is coming from Iran, in which case we have a response to Iran. We miscalculate, and then now we're in a direct conflict with Iran because we had false understandings of who attacked us. Now, there's also accidental conflict. What happens if we accidentally launch a missile? What happens if someone accidentally launches a missile? You might think, who accidentally launches a missile? Believe it or not, it happens. There's actually been accidentally nuclear weapons dropped in the United States in the swamps of Georgia. We have nuclear weapons that are just chilling out in a swamp somewhere because we accidentally dropped them. What if that happens in the North Africa, West Asia region? That could cause a really big conflict and conflagration. And same thing with proxy wars, where other groups might start to manipulate different groups there. For instance, Russia has other support systems. China or other nations, you know, uh, Iran has a lot of proxies that they might use to do their own attacks. Or maybe the United States uses other proxies to do fighting for them. But then that risks, again, spilling over and leading into drawing. So... Our presence just being there can cause some really big wars to happen, even if they're not there to fight in a really big war. Now, in addition to those, we've got a lot of different weapons over there. And there's a lot of different apps that you can talk about based on the specific types of weapons that we have in place. You know, the first one is TNWs, tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons located in Turkey are battlefield nuclear weapons. They are designed to be used, which is dangerous because that lowers the nuclear threshold. And if something's designed to be used, well, then that makes it much more likely that it's going to be used. And if you use nuclear weapons, then someone else could use nuclear weapons. And then you have all-out nuclear war, and that is bad. So, there's going to be a lot of apps that talk about getting rid of tactical nuclear weapons. But there's other types of weapons. You know, there's also bunker busters. Bunker busters are really interesting. We just gave a bunch to Israel so that they can go after Hamas. Now, bunker busters, as they sound like, they're designed to bust bunkers. We developed them when we were in the Gulf War and the attack and the Iraq War, because in order to uh, defend themselves from the U.S. military bombing campaigns, the Iraq military dug these deep, 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 deep bunkers to protect their soldiers and their vital infrastructure. And Iran started doing the same thing to protect their nuclear their nuclear um, energy and weapons programs. So they started digging them into mountains. So when the United States is like, well, we don't like that. So if you're going to dig these deep bunkers, we're going to build weapons in order to bust those bunkers. Now, some of them are conventional. Some of them are nuclear tipped. All of them dangerously increase the threshold for what type of weapons we do and do not allow on the battlefield and threaten the nuclear taboo or just the weapons of mass destruction taboo, which can make it more likely that chemical, biological, or other sorts of weapons are used. Now, arm sales. Are arm sales military presence? I don't know. That's a topicality question. You should talk to Scott and watch his videos. He'll have better conversations about that. But potentially ending our arm sales to parts of that region might also be a way to reduce our military presence. Now, we use other types of things, landmines. Woo, those things are nasty. There's international conventions against them that we haven't signed. Those leave entire places just unlivable for years and years and years and years. And people are... People's entire lives are uprooted, killed, and destroyed by them for long after conflicts are done. Um, so ending landmines, same thing with like cluster munitions, which we gave to uh, Ukraine to use on the battlefield. Also dubs, which are depleted uranium bullets, which is a type of irradiated uh, bullet, essentially, that we use for armor-piercing rounds. Various types of UAVs, you know, are autonomous vehicles, you know, especially some of those laws, those lethal autonomous vehicles. Do we have them? Do we not have them? Should we ban them in advance? Is that, a, is that topical? I don't know. You know, but also some of our other types of things like our submarines or our carrier groups. We have carrier groups 
stationed in specific places, whether we're talking about Bahrain or we're talking about additional carrier groups that we've now brought in due to recent tensions. Maybe some of these specific types of arms or arm configurations should be removed. But we're not done with the AF. What else? In addition to specific types of arms or weapons or weapon systems or vehicles or things like that, there's specific personnel contentions, special operations, but also the intelligence services. You know, we got all sorts of alphabet boys out there, whether they're CIA, NSA, or things that I don't know, maybe the men in black. I'm not really sure. I don't have security clearance. Nobody tells me these things. Um, but their secret groups doing secret things. Should they be doing those things? I don't know. Some apps will say no. But there's also private military contractors, people like... Blackwater. Now, the Wagner Group in Russia is the one that was in the news lately, but Russia's not the only one with private military contractors. We use our own, and they've gotten into a lot of trouble because they are not actual militaries. They are not governed by things like the Geneva Convention or other international laws, and they operate in a very, very weird gray area, which means that they can get away with doing some really, really horrible things. And so there's some pretty big advantages to getting rid of private military contractors. But then there's also environmental contentions. Our military is the biggest, one of the biggest polluters on the planet. There's, our carriers are just environmental chaos agents. Our bases are horrific for the environment. We do burn pits to get rid of our waste. Our weapons destroy the environment and pollute it. I mean, we kill the ocean with our fuel, with our runoff, with our garbage. You know, the corals killed. We promote acidification. We run into marine mammals with our ships. All of that happens, and all of those are pretty big reasons why we can help the environment by getting rid of our military presence in those areas. Now, not only is our military presence bad for the environment, it's also bad for the health of our service members, but as well as all of the many, many people living near our military presence. I mean, the mental and physical health of our troops and veterans is directly impacted by combat. Health is, war is not good for your health. Whether we're talking improvised explosive devices, whether we're talking about bullets, or whether we're talking about PTSD. It's not good for your health. Same thing is true by those that are on the underside of this conflict. You know, uh, whether you're maimed by an IED or those landmines or you're one of those civilian casualties from an errant drone strike or maybe you've never been, you know, hit by a drone but you know people have or maybe you've not actually experienced that drone strike but every single night you go to sleep and you hear them flying over and you wonder if the next one's for you. All of those things can be reduced through reducing our military presence. And the same thing is true with pollution and disease from weapons and war. Those burn pits that we talked about earlier that hurt the environment. Well, guess what? People that um, have been around those burn pits that were workers there. There's a lot of lawsuits right now uh, in our nation for people who worked in those burn pits during the Gulf War and the Iraq War. And how they're suffering just horrific health consequences as results from that. Okay, this is going to be the last of the AF contentions that we talk about. Is this the last of the AF contentions? No, this is the biggest topic ever, so there's going to be a lot more, but this is going to be the last ones that we talk about. So there's also going to be a lot of contentions about marginalized groups because war is not good for anybody, but war is especially not good for those that are already most vulnerable. War increases instances of gendered violence. Gendered violence is actually used as a weapon of war. Gendered violence also occurs in the presence of military bases, whether we're talking forms of sexual violence and forms of um, that come at the expense of sex workers or all sorts of other things. There's also LGBTQ violence uh, that happens in the wake of war um, that happens in um, all of these instances. Uh, military presence and these conflicts exacerbate uh, ethnic, religious, racial, cultural minority tension that can lead to ethnic cleansing, all-out genocide. Um, People fleeing these situations become refugees or also facing sometimes horrific circumstances. Um, some might not be refugees per se, but they definitely become migrants and they still experience conflict. But that then process of migration leads to global challenges as a result. And migrant populations are uniquely vulnerable to all sorts of things, whether it's trafficking, whether it's other forms of exploitation or 
bad health conditions. Um, indigenous groups also bear the brunt of these types of conflicts. Same with children, elderly, disabled. War is not good for anybody, but it's already not good for people who are experiencing structural or other kind of specific violences. I guess we're going to go with that word. Sure, we'll go with that word. Now, finally, there's various kinds of movements and ethics contingents, we'll call them, that uh, removing our military presence can invigorate anti-war movements or anti-nuclear movements or, um, again, this might be polarizing BDS movements, might lead to you know two-state solutions or decolonization movements where we think about pulling out our presence in other places, abolition movements because people who say things like we need to abolish prison systems also believe that we should abolish things like the military. And there's also just sorts of different sorts of alternative understandings of international relations and ethics. Like I said, we're getting rid of military presence can put us more in line with cosmopolitan understandings of our role as global citizens. And while that might seem ethereal and sort of critique and weird, I promise that can be explained in very simple ways that work very well for traditional judges, parents, lay judges, whoever. Neg contentions. This is a lot less. The neg side of this topic is kind of hard. Now, there's some really good arguments, but there's less varieties. So, the biggest category of arguments against this are going to be the deterrences and the assurances. Basically, our military presence in that region is necessary to deter aggressors. So we got to have our troops. We got to have our personnel. We got to have our weapons there so that they can scare other people who want to do us harm. Who are those people? Iran, China, Russia, North Korea various terrorists, you know, all the people that are the bad guys that we usually think about, you can talk about them on this topic. Now, aside from just deterrence, now, these different people, they don't only want to harm us, they want to harm our allies. And our allies have been given assurances by us that we will protect them. And part of a commitment to that protection is our military presence. And so, a lot of neg contentions will be talking about how if we pull back our military presence, that will be sending a signal to our allies that we're not serious about the security guarantees that we promised them, about the assurances, the military assurances that we've given them. And so our allies are going to freak out. So Israel, who's in the middle of major conflicts right now, all of a sudden if we start pulling out troops, what are they going to do? I mean, they're already being aggressive when they feel like they have the full support of the United States. Will they be even more aggressive if they feel like they're on their own? What about Saudi Arabia? What about NATO, European Union, Japan, South Korea, etc.? Anybody that we've given assurances to, if they look at what we're doing there, how will they react? Now, hegemony, we talked about that. This can apply to the NEG, where we can say that the United States military presence is necessary for hegemony, which is key to life. Hedge is the best. A lot of y'all talk about that. I can talk about that here. Now, there's a lot of arguments to also be made about executive flexibility. So the flip side to all those arguments like, yay, democ democracy, we need to have democratic processes. We, the people, should decide if we should go to war. There's a flip side to that coin that says, no, the president is the commander of the military. The president is in charge with protecting citizens. The president should have the flexibility to decide when and where we go to war. And they need the flexibility to do it on a dime. And all of these other sorts of things where we remove our presence is an affront to that notion of flexibility. And finally, there's a lot of domestic pol political concerns. I mean, if we just started pulling back our military presence, there's going to be a lot of people who feel a lot of ways about that. I mean, that would cause huge impacts in terms of debates in Congress. Different wings of both parties would freak out, and that would cause major ramifications for elections. And hold on, let me, let me get this straight. This topic is for January, February of 2024. Oh yeah, we have a major election going on that year. I promise you that if we started pulling out all of our troops or our military presence from the North Africa, West Asia region, that it would impact elections. And I'm sure the populace would feel some way about that too. Now, the final thing that we're going to talk about is the contentions that everybody can use. Okay, so these are some that there can have a good, robust debate, whether you're the AF or the NEG, and 
these are fair game for everybody. So the first one is terrorism. If you're the AF, you can talk about how the United States military presence in the region causes blowback and how it leads to anti-American sentiment that can foment terrorist attacks. Things like ISIS, things like Al-Qaeda, all started because of antipathy towards our presence in the region and our support for Israel. Now, this can also cause domestic terrorism, okay? Because there's a lot of people who hate our military presence abroad on the right or the left, and they can do their own tax here in the United States. Now, on the flip side of that, there's authors who are going to be talking about, in the cases, they're going to talk about how terrorism, things like ISIS, things like Al-Qaeda, those things are real, and that the best way to disrupt them is not to pull our military presence out of the region, but instead it's to take the fight to them. It's to keep our troops there where they can be engaging the troops in their backyard instead of us fighting them in our backyard. So there's a robust debate to be had on both sides about whether or not the United States military presence is good or bad for terrorism, domestically as well as internationally. Same thing is true with the economy. Now, AFS can talk about how we're spending a ton of money on our military. We spend more money on our military than anything. And a lot of that goes towards keeping this massive military presence overseas. And so our budgets would be better if we weren't spending as much. And we could do a lot of things with that. We could build roads. We could build schools. We could build everything. We could have health care. Think about all the stuff we could have if we didn't have as many bombs. So those are going to be AF types of arguments for the economy. Now, on the flip side, on the NEG, they're going to say that our military presence is necessary to protect trade. You have things like there, like the Suez Canal, where so much global trade goes through. If a hostile group were to shut that down, the global economy would be over. The Straits of Hormuz is an important, important trade route that our military is necessary to protect from places like Iran shutting it down, where if that happened, the global supply of oil in and out of that would cause mass chaos to the global economy. Now, in addition to that, well, we likes our oil, we likes our other things, we likes our lithium, we likes our resources, and well, you know, our military is really helpful at securing them and protecting them. And if we were to not have our military over there, maybe we wouldn't get as much of that as we wanted. And so those things would have negative impacts to our economy too, because then we would be more vulnerable to price shocks and maybe groups like OPEC would have more power and they could then shut down all production and that could jack up the price of oil, again, causing ripple effects through the economy. Military readiness. Another thing for both sides to talk about. How prepared is our military to fight wars? Are we going to win if we fight? Well, on the AF side, they can say no. And our military presence, while you think it's good to have all those military presences in that region, it's not because it can overstretch our military because we're spread too thin. And we need to bring our troops back. We need to bring our um, stuff back. And we need to maybe move it around. We need to offset some of our troops. Maybe uh, we need to pull some stuff out of this part of North Africa, West Asia, and put it over in this part. Or maybe we need to pull it out of the region region altogether and pivot it over to Asia or pivot it over to, I don't know, over near Russia and Poland and those places. So all of that stuff are going to be potential sorts of discussions for the affirmative. Now on the negative, they can talk about, well, basing and power projection are sort of necessary. If we don't have our power over there, and if people don't see our big carriers, they don't see our big ships, they don't see our, you know, F-16s doing cool stuff in the air, they're going to think that we're not as powerful as we are. So we need to be able to, one, demonstrate that we have this power everywhere, but two, we also need to be able to actually project it. And like, you know, it's one thing to have a giant military if we can't put it into effect and have the supply chains ready and the logistics ready so that we can actually execute wars on the other side of the world on the drop of a dime. Then are we really ready? So as much as we might not like the consequences of these bases, as much as we might not like having our carrier groups all over there, some of this is necessary so that we can respond on a moment's notice to existential threats. 
And then there's drones, the drones of it all. Drones are going to be a huge part of this topic. Lots of teams on the app and the net are going to talk about drones, 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 drones. We use a lot of drones in the region, okay? And a lot of different places, and a lot of people do it. The military uses some drones. CIA uses drones. People that I don't even know exist uses drones. Everybody has a drone, all right? And for the AF, they're going to talk about casualties, civilian casualties, and how more civilians are killed than actually enemy combatants. They're going to talk about how our drone warfare violates international law, or how our use of drones and extensive use of drones is going to lead to a drones arm race, which is going to be bad news bears for everybody. Now, on the NEG side, they're going to talk about how, while drones, we might not like them, they're much better than putting our troops in harm's way. And while we might hate any civilian casualties... The raw number says that drones are better than other forms of combat and that these drones, while scary, they do deter other far worse forms of combat. And you say arms race bad. The neg is going to say arms race is happening. You might not think it's good, but it's inevitable and we need to win it. Places like China, Russia and other groups are accelerating their arms program. So is Iran. The only way to do anything about it is to not pretend that the arms race doesn't exist. It's to win the arms race. And then finally, last one we're going to talk about for everybody is democracy. Again, and this is going to be democracy at home versus democracy at broad. Some people say that our democratic processes have been violated by these wars or that our, these wars and military presences impact the democratic expressions of these other nations. Well, you know, maybe our military presence is necessary to protect other democracies like Israel, okay, or other fledgling democracies in the region and the only way to preserve democracy in the region is to have the protection of the united states military and all of its might and all of its presence in the north africa west asia region whoo that was a lot and there's a lot more that we can talk about, but we're not going to cover that today. This is just a smattering of things for you to consider as you get ready to debate this topic. So all of you traditional LDers out there, I wish you the best of luck getting ready for this topic. Please, please, please watch the other topic lectures because while they're not directly targeted and labeled and titled traditional LD lecture, I promise you they're going to have information that is relevant to every round that you're going to have, and they're going to have information and research that is going to be very helpful for you getting wins on both the AF and the NEG on this topic. So if you're getting ready for competition, stay tuned to the My LD Coach video feed because there's going to be a lot more good stuff coming to you.